Welcome to Adapter's Advantage, breakthrough moments that lead to success. Our podcast brings you insider stories of the moments that matter, turning points on the sometimes rocky road to success. Here's your host, Mark Magnaca, president and co-founder of Alego, the workforce training and readiness platform built for distributed teams. Hi, this is Mark Magnaca. And on behalf of Adapters Advantage, I want to welcome you to this episode with Jeff Duckworth. Jeff's the president of John Hancock Investments. We're going to have a great conversation today about a wide range of topics, but I'd like to start by giving a little background on Jeff. Uh, in his role, he oversees the distribution of financial products to broker dealers and RIAs of John Hancock Investments products. He's also responsible for the Capital Markets Research, the Portfolio Consulting Services, National Accounts, and Sales Operations, where he oversees the management of about 225 people. As a member of the firm's executive management team, Jeff helped shape and execute the firm's vision and strategic planning. Since joining John Hancock back in 1993, Jeff served in a number of roles, starting as a wholesaler, a divisional sales manager, a national sales manager, and a head of distribution. He earned his BA in financial management from Clemson University, where he's also a member of the executive committee for the Clemson Alumni Association Board. And in fact, he's so devoted to Clemson that he just left Boston after 12 years and he moved to, wait for it, Clemson, South Carolina. <laughs> so he's also an active board, with, uh, board member with Expect Miracles Foundation, a great organization um, that I've gotten introduced to through Jeff and chairman of the Investment Company Institute's Sales and Marketing Committee. So with that, welcome Jeff Duckworth. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. Looking forward to our discussion today. So Jeff, given what I just described, when people meet you and they know you're from John Hancock and they ask you that question, so what do you do? How do you answer that question? You know, it's, it, that's, that's a tough one, as you know, Mark, because so many people don't understand our business. So if I, if I were to answer it to someone that's in our business, I would say that I manage a team of sales professionals that help financial advisors run a better practice, create better engagement with their clients, and help those clients meet their goals and objectives. Now, that sounds like a corporate speech, but, but the, if, I, if the average Joe just asked me what I did, I, I work for John Hancock Investment Management in Boston. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, well, Jeff, you know, a big part of the theme of this podcast is the notion of adapting. And because of our personal relationship, I know there have been a number of these adaptation points in your life up to this point. So I'd like to jump right in and ask you to describe a personal pivot point or a moment of learning that changed your approach to your role. You know, at being in this business for what, Martin, 27 years now, I guess, I, um, I've had a lot of those moments, uh, as I'm sure anybody would that's been around a, a certain business for a really long time. But I guess, if it, I guess if you forced me to pick one, it would probably be back in 2000. I was working for JC Bradford at that point. Uh, Payne Weber bought JC Bradford and, and uh, they really had no use for this small wholesaling company that we had built there. And so here I had this team of individuals that uh, were all looking for work, uh, people that I had um, convinced to come work for us. I felt a certain obligation to help them find jobs. And so that's what I did. I went to work hard, uh, making phone calls and looking for places that would interview this, this group of uh, who I thought were great salespeople. And, and luckily they all found jobs. They moved on and had great careers. Um, but I would say that was a pivotal moment for me because it was a great lesson for me is, is, is because by the way, when I made those calls, every call of course would end by, well, well Jeff, what are you going to be doing? Um, that was not the purpose of the calls, but what, but what I took out of that was if you always do the right thing and you're always looking out for your people, you know, it just, it, things just work out. And so I, I think that was just a great life lesson for me. That's helped me, you know, and that was in 2000, we're now 20 years later. And I think that still helped me today. Jeff, that's such a great point if, when you can look at the processional effect of that decision, because again, based on our personal connection, um, be, be, I know you already had uh, affection for those that, that group of people, uh, one of whom I know was our mutual friend, Mike Moran, but because you did that with Mike Moran, because of the, the not only what we're gonna talk about, some of the unique training methodology that you did to take someone who worked for the phone company and helped him become a superstar in financial services that has continued 25 you know, years later. Um, but he's the one who introduced me to you, right? So you just, you can't help. Just, you just never, you never, you never know how these things work out, do you? you yeah. really don't. 
So let's just touch on JC Bradford for a minute because it seems like you were doing some very innovative things back then. I remember you telling me the story. And I think this was back in the VHS era um, where, where you already were a believer in the concept of using the power of video to help people capture best practices. Who came up with that idea and how did it work? Uh, well, it was me um, and, you know, call it by accident or luck, whatever you want to call it. We had a unique sales process there and that we were not offering a product that was available every day. It would, it, would, it would be certain offerings you might have 30 days, 60 days to sell that offering out. And so we would just pound it hard during that 30 to 60 day period. So all the salespeople lived in Nashville. Um, we operated out of there and on Monday they would fly out. They'd fly back into Nashville on Thursday and every Friday we would get in a conference room in the building and talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what, what's working, what's not working, best idea sharing, and we'd videotape. Um, and of course, to your point, it was all VHS back at that point. And, and so I'd call someone out and say, all right, get up and tell us how you position XYZ. They would get up, we'd videotape it. We'd immediately go take that videotape out, run over to a TV. The group as a whole would, 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 would uh, review it, yep. seek it, make it better, steal the ideas, correct things that need to be corrected, and then move on and do another one. And I can say, while it was a grueling process, I think if you were to ask anybody that was part of our organization back then, they would say it was probably the greatest training that they'd ever had. And that was you know, the early use of video. Uh, obviously, what we can do nowadays is a lot easier than that. But it was kind of the same effect, though, when you think about it, just done differently. Well, you know, it's not lost on me, Jeff, because one of the interesting things that's happened for me in, in this process is here, I thought we had stumbled on something new. But I remember when I first was talking to Mike, when we were rolling out with his team, he said, this is not a new idea. This is a new application of an idea, but it's not a new idea. And he was right. You know, one of the things that you just said, the phrase you use, just get up and do it, like get up and do it. I think that's one of the hardest parts of the, the post-pandemic time that we're in right now. There was a certain magic when you had people together and you could sort of pick up on people's energy. And so what do you find has to happen now, particularly while we're in this remote environment, regardless of how long that, that lasts, to capture a little bit of that electricity that you described where someone's on the spot in front of their peers, um, not with the goal of trying to embarrass them, but with the goal of legitimately exposing where are they strong and where are they weak so they can be faced with the truth and then work on the things that they need to improve. Yeah, it's certainly harder to do remotely. I don't think there's any question about that and that it's, it's harder to be impromptu. Now, there's certainly ways you can do that as a divisional manager, for instance, you may have your team together uh, on a Zoom call. Uh, you might be recording that Zoom call and you might call people out, say, hey, John Doe, would you position XYZ for me? And so that, that's an option. Um, but you have to have accountability. Uh, as an example of that, as we feel like um, our specialists today who, who become such an important part of our organization, these are specialists that would cover things like ETFs and separately managed accounts and other areas that we're trying to grow our business to support our regular wholesalers in the field. Um, and we, we feel like, hey, you know what, this is a group that we haven't spent as much time with to uh, really truly train through video and through presentation training and so forth. So right now they're, we're in the middle of a presentation contest just for the specialists. We've done that for years with the business consultants, our wholesalers in the field, but we've never done it with specialists. So what are they doing? They're going on to Lego, they're recording their, their presentations. We have a committee that will review all these, will ele elevate the top three to the whole company. The whole company will then watch those three and they will vote on the best presenter out of that group. So that, that's actually something that's happening right now. And the winner will be announced at our winter sales meeting here coming up in a few weeks. So I wanna just roll back um, for the last virtual sales meeting you had in the spring. Um, so just after COVID started, what are the top three benefits that you think listeners of this podcast could benefit from as they think about their own national sales meetings or even just a, a sales meeting? Sure. Uh, well, one of the biggest benefits, just, just talking benefits in general, to me, the biggest is our national sales meetings in the past were really just for the salespeople. Um, and because of that, people in product, people in marketing, uh, people in operations, and the list could go on and on, didn't have the ability to be present there. Mm. Uh, by the virtual nature of meetings today, um, it doesn't cost us anymore to have all these other people connect. And what that means, it connects, I guess, the best word is it brings us together that much more as a team. Um, because the people that would normally would not participate are now participating in learning and listening to the ideas that are being shared and so forth. And that, that goes a long way, I think, in helping everyone understand. Now I have a better feel for 
where my role in the organization, what it means to the whole organization, because now I'm actually watching it in action and I've seen how the wholesalers are using this. So that's it's just a massive byproduct. Um, and then, and then if I could go on a little further and maybe just talk about some things that we did to make sure that we really pulled off what I think was the best meeting we could have possibly had this summer, and we'll hopefully repeat that here in December, is blank piece of paper. Don't, don't, don't think about what you've done in, in live face-to-face -face meetings in the past. Just kind of forget all that. Start new, start fresh. Every idea is worth discussing to make it unique. And the biggest thing we probably did that we've never done in a live meeting is... What I didn't want to do as the host of the meeting is me coming up after every speaker and all they see for all the, you know, the two to three day period is me introducing more speakers. What do we do? We had people that normally don't get on stage and present at our meetings, introducing the next speaker, wrapping up another speaker and so forth and so on. So we had throughout the course of the three day period this, this summer, over 55 individuals that played some formal role of some kind in that meeting uh, on camera. And that was big. Again, it just brought everyone together as a team. So my advice is, and I don't know if I hit three or not on your, on your question, but my advice would be just, just open your mind, plan it down to every minute of, of detail. And I guess the last thing I will say is that first meeting what we did this summer was about 90% pre-recorded, 10% live. Because I'm so concerned about the technology blowing up on us if everyone was watching live. Well, we're expanding a little bit at the December meeting, because we, we feel more confident with the technology, and we'll probably be more like 60, 40, 60% taped and 40% live. Um, but beyond that, we're going to hit a lot of the things, a lot of the same things, make it feel very special for the audience. Well, Jeff, that's one of the things I heard over and again from people who, who work for John Hancock Investments who attended that meeting. And, you know, one of the things that you said that, it, that may be not immediately apparent to people but if you think a little bit deeper about it, it emerges. And that is the idea that for, for almost all day long, we're looking for meaning. And if you work in product, you work in operations, like sometimes it's hard, there's a disconnect between how hard you work and it actually having meaning. And now all of a sudden, when you get to participate in a meeting like that, which heretofore you couldn't because of economics and other reasons, now you get to sort of see the end result of all of the day-to-day -day work that you do. You know, that's, that's one of those things that um, I think when this is all over at some point, that is one of the things that's going to stay with us, which is a recognition of helping people, both the people who got to attend and then those 55 people that you just talked about. Think about how much more interesting it is as the viewer. And that's regardless of who the MC is, to, to just not have the same person every single time over two days. That's, that's you're spot on with that. And, and uh, I would say the, what was a byproduct of all this is I think, and I think we have to be careful as everyone's working from home still, um, you have the chance to really lose the sense of community, I think, um, by this, you know, pandemic that we're in. And this is a way to bring that community together, uh, to make them feel as a team. And because otherwise, you know, it's, it's tough to feel like you're part of a team when you're at, when you got thousands of people all around the country, just doing their own thing. So uh, that would be my one piece of advice, figure out a way to make this um, feel like a team when you're putting any, any kind of meeting together like this. So Jeff, if we had a vaccine that was 100% effective tomorrow, would you go back to doing it the way you did in 2019? You know, I, I don't think that this is where the, you know, I, I embrace change, but this is where the old school probably come out of me a little bit. I don't think anything will ever truly replace face-to-face -face contact. Um, I don't. But will our meetings be the same in the future as they used to be? No. Um, we'll do uh, pre-work via video. We'll do post work via video. Um, we'll actually shorten the agenda time probably when we are physically together, allow more interaction among our people, not just to sit in meetings all day. I think we've learned a lot from this about how to really truly run a better meeting, getting more people involved, making them more fun and so forth and so on. So I think the creativity juices are flowing so much because they had to, you know, you, you think about it when you're put under pressure, you can go one of two ways. You can go down in the dumps and not step up to it, or you can rise above it and get your creative juices really going. And that's, that's really what happened to us. And I think the same thing will happen. If, if this meeting in December was live, it would be split probably between video connectivity, pre and post, along with in, in, you know, in-person information and celebration and, and communion together and all that kind of stuff that you'd have, of course, when you're in person. So it's gonna be a combination of both. And because of it, I think our people will like the meetings better, they'd be better engaged, It'd be more effective. I think that's absolutely a critical point as you think about just the the, the silver lining. Uh, because for so long, Jeff, think of how many meetings you went to. I know so many meetings I went to. They were in the most wonderful places. 
in Florida and California and Hawaii, and you're at some beautiful hotel and some beautiful location, but then you're eight plus hours sitting in a room. By the time you get back outside, this the sun is setting and you've flown 12 hours to get there. You know, so so much of that when you look back on it, you think, why did we do it that way? Wasn't there a better way? And you know, maybe there wasn't at that time, but I think now that we've been through this, it's hard to look back and uh, and not consider it. So in our, our remaining time, Jeff, uh, one question I did want to just bring you all the way back to the beginning. I remembered um, when, when we were talking about kind of how you got into the business, I, I remember you talking about you actually started all the way back in a different industry working for Simmons Betting. And what I'm curious about is when you think about some of the young people listening to this podcast uh, who may be at their first job, what are some of the things that you learned back in the Simming, Simmons Betting time um, that have been valuable for you as, as you both transition to financial services and, and maybe even throughout? Well, I guess one right off the, just off the bat, when people hear how do you go from selling mattresses, uh, let's, let's not glorify this, selling mattresses to furniture stores and apartment stores to ultimately becoming a wholesaler and then, uh, and then doing what I do today. Um, anything is possible. That's the first thing to take away, I think, for, for young people that might be watching this. But beyond that, I think the biggest things that I learned during that time period that actually prepared me for what I ultimately went on into my, in, in my career was when I worked for Simmons, uh, I ran my own business. I worked out of my home. I covered my own expenses. Uh, so you want to talk about a great training ground is spend, spend company money like it's your money. Um, you'll look at the world differently when you do that. So even if you do have an expense account uh, today, uh, run it like it was your own money because it's your business. Uh, that was number one. And secondly, I also realized because of that, um, for me to succeed is all on me. Um, I couldn't necessarily count on people to help me out. Um, I was out there on an island on my own. That was a great lesson as a young person. And I've carried that mentality all the way through. So in other words, there's no excuses. If things aren't working well, don't complain. Just jump in, fix it. Uh, I, you know, each individual owns their own destiny. And that, that's the things I think I've learned at Simmons that I carried when I ultimately became you know, a wholesaler in this business. And even it, it had a distribution today, nothing's changed since in the last 30 years, honestly, about my mindset when it comes to that. So the last question I have for you is based on all that experience, including what you just described, going all the way back to the Simmons days, what do you see as the most important skill that you think people should either learn or improve on today? Well, that's a tough one. Um, I would say, um, as a manager, I mean, I'll answer from a manager's perspective first. As a manager, um, every person's, and, and by the way, whether you're a manager or just dealing with people, every single person is different. And the way you have to deal with people needs to be unique and different. I think that's become even more evident probably during this pandemic that we're in today. So if I could, if I could pass along one message or one lesson that I've learned um, would be treat, it, treat each individual as an individual. Um, never assume anything. Uh, I think that's just critical to uh, bonding for better relationships, for driving better success. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll liken it back to the strategic intent that we have in John Hancock Investment Management, which, by the way, we created in 2008 and it has not changed since then. And that is we're an organization that is people-focused, family-friendly, and team-oriented. And I, every decision I make is based off of those three principles. And uh, if it doesn't match up, then we don't do it. It's that simple. So whether it's that or whatever the principles are, people uh, live by, some people might call it their true north, whatever it is, don't waver on that. Don't deviate from that. Uh, live your life, personal and professional, based off of whatever those principles may be, and you'll be successful. Yep. So I think that just the notion of anchoring yourself to what you've just described here, figuring out what's important and then running it out and realizing that for most of us, the great joy you have in your life when you look back if you're lucky enough with your own family and likewise with your extended, you know, your, your corporate family, um, the notion that what you've done to help other people is ultimately where you get the greatest joy. No question. Absolutely. So Jeff, if people want to, to um, connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I'm, I'll be the first to admit I'm not the best LinkedIn nerd, but that's the best way to go. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll, I'll get an email that pops up that says, hey, someone wants to be your friend on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll, I'll go check it out and I'll make sure but, uh, that's the best way to do it for sure. Sounds great. Well, Jeff, it's been a, just such a great journey that we've had here together. Um, really appreciate all of your support. And I'm definitely one of those people that um, because you said yes back in 2014, 
And because you said yes to being on a video that was played about a thousand times throughout the industry, uh, it changed the trajectory of my life and, and of this company. Well, I, I'm happy to play a small part in that. It's the reality is though, it's your, it's your product that's doing it and, and, and you and the, and the service, of course, that comes along with that, but uh, nothing happens by accident and y'all driven that success. So true. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks for joining us this week on Adapters Advantage, available on all major podcast platforms. Make sure you visit our website, alego.com, where you can subscribe to our podcast so you'll never miss an episode. If you liked this show, you might want to check out our virtual training kit to learn how to keep a remote team running at full speed. Go to alego.com slash virtual to download your kit today. Be sure to tune in for our next episode. And don't forget, one new idea can change your life.